I would like to welcome you to the second session uh, of uh, this conference. My name is Peter Falk. Um, we start with a little bit delay, but it was the first coffee break uh, since two years, so probably we really like to, to discuss, and that is, that is quite important concerning uh, our field. The topic of this session uh, is um, commissioning of accelerators and the usage of beam instrumentation uh, for operation. And um, we will have the Faraday Cup award winning ceremony and uh, talk uh, then also in this session. The first speaker is Steve Lidia. Steve Lidia is a senior scientist at, uh, and professor at uh, Michigan State University. Um, before, he worked uh, at various projects at Berkeley National Labs, uh, including synchrotron radiation sources, heavy ion accelerators, electron photo injectors, and uh, very versatile work. Since 2013, he is uh, at the Beam Diagnostics Group and then headed this group uh, at the um, uh, facility for rare isotope uh, beams, um, which uh, begins in operation this year, and the topic is about the commissioning of this facility. So, please, Steve. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you to, to uh, 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 the conference committees for inviting this talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. So, I want to talk today about um, uh, commissioning, um, in particular, beam diagnostics we've had for effort com commissioning um, over the last few years. Um, so, just in terms of a general outline, we'll go through a number of challenges and uh, then get into the specific systems and how we've uh, used those for um, beginning of op operations. So, just to um, refamiliarize folks with, with the facility, um, it is a, uh, a new low energy um, heavy ion beam uh, facility uh, in terms of a heavy ion LINAC, um, operates at, um, at, uh, at, at full commissioning up to 400 kilowatts uh, CW. Um, and then that generates, um, through target interactions, uh, um, uh, um, uh, cocktails of rare isotopes that are then um, sorted and filtered and delivered to experiments for, um, uh, for study. Um, we provide um, um, basically all, um, um, all elements, um, short half-lives, um, and we have uh, facilities for um, studying fast, stopped, and re-accelerated beams. Um, in terms of the, the challenges to diagnosis and instrumentation, um, so this is a heavy ion machine. It's, it's an intense, it's low energy. Um, betas go from uh, 0.03 to 0.6, um, um, uh, or 60 percent the speed of light. Uh, we look at um, uh, um, simultaneous acceleration of multiple charge state beams. Um, we need to ensure low beam losses, uh, fast machine protection, um, down to about 35 microseconds of um, you know, beam mitigation time. We are operating a liquid lithium charge stripper, so that's again one of the first in the world. Um, we have a high, um, frag, a high rate fragment separator um, that also needs to be instrumented. Um, the operational flexibility requires a large dynamic range and beam intensity with both CW and pulsed modes, um, pilot beams as well as production beams. Um, and so that provides some challenges for beam diagnostics and machine protection system. Um, and then every couple of weeks, we uh, retune the beam, uh, retune the accelerator for another, uh, another type of ion. So each run, each experimental run, runs one to two weeks. Um, we're down for a week. We're, we come up for another week um, to run our, um, our new radi radiation effects beam line. Uh, and then we retune the accelerator. So we're constantly retuning um, and utilizing the diagnostics to um, um, enhance our scientific productivity. Kind of shown on the, on the, on the right there is um, kind of an example of the number of, of beams, so rare isotope beams that we wish to produce um, given a primary beam. So we have a catalog of primary beams that we, we need to develop tunes for um, um, and then to deliver the, the rare isotopes. So in terms of our acceleration goals, so the, the facility has been in operation since, since around 2017 when we first commissioned uh, the front end um, and through the, um, through the RFQ, kind of shown there. So what's shown here, this is, I call this my bristling battleship um, um, diagram just showing all of the, the beam instrumentation we have. It's essentially, it's a lot of, in, this, in, the, in the front end here at, at low energy, we have a lot of uh, profile monitors. These are wire scanner type of uh, measurements. We have um, um, attenuator screens. We have you know, your, your typical um, Faraday cups, viewers, et cetera, um, all for um, mostly low energy. Um, and so that was, that provided us um, um, uh, the diagnostics we needed to commission the, the front end beam line up to 500 kilovolts. Um, in uh, the next year, we installed the first three cryo modules um, and a diagnostics beam line, 
a short diagnostic session right, right at the end um, that provided us um, uh, confirmation of acceleration of the 2 MeV per nucleon. Again, this is all CW. Uh, the next year, um, the first LINAC section, the first full LINAC section was, uh, was commissioned uh, up to the first folding section, so that's 20 MeV per nucleon. Um, now this, um, those last two years now provided us essentially confirmation of the, uh, the next um, main series of diagnostics, the, the beam, uh, beam position monitors and the current monitors, uh, as well as some of the radiation monitors. Um, in 2020, we completed acceleration throughout the entire uh, LINAC structure. You can see it's a double-folded LINAC structure, um, it's kind of basically a, our paperclip design. Um, um, we were able to accelerate beam up to 200 MeV per, um, per nucleon. Um, and then a follow-on experiment, we um, uh, provided excel um, simultaneous acceleration of three charge states uh, that were um, generated at the, I can see that the charge stripper, which is about right there, um, as well as the charge selector. And so we generated um, simultaneous acceleration on that second LINAC section up to 185 MeV per U. Um, last year, uh, we successfully commissioned the liquid lithium charge stripper, kind of a picture shown here. This was a recent Physics Today cover. Um, we also commissioned our, um, our second um, ion source, uh, at least the, the plasma chamber, so the, our high, um, high performance ECR source SOTS versus plasma. Um, and then we also had beam on target and our first rare isotope production, basically closing out the project and showing um, that we've produced our, for our key performance parameters. That gets us to this year, where we've now started the user program, and over the summer we've had our first three experiments, and we're looking um, for the next three experiments um, coming up later in this calendar year. So in, in terms of the diagnostics, um, we've mentioned this before, um, uh, already. The, the front end has a, a large component of you know, Faraday cups, viewers, current monitors, profile monitors, et cetera. Um, those have all been commissioned and, and are, are used now um, in, in conti you know, continuously for developing new beam species, um, at least the, uh, the, the new um, primary beams that we need. Um, the LINAC section contains a number of, of of loss monitors, uh, our beam position monitors, and um, um, are in um, basically at full production right now. We have a complement of about 150 BPMs. These are button type BPMs, operate both at cryogenic temperatures inside of cryo modules as well as um, uh, as well as in the warm sections. Um, but they're essentially the same design um, in, with um, uh, a few different scales. Um, the um, you know, basically the uh, the other um, diagram on the bottom here is showing. Uh, the distribution of the, a large number of, of diagnostics throughout the Linux um, section. So in total, it's, it's, it's over 500, um, 500 devices, um, including uh, a number of devices that are, that are in vacuum as well as um, um, external, um, some that are also attached to the, um, the beam pipe inside of the, the cryo modules. We have uh, a fast thermometry system, um, which, is used, um, uh, which is looking at changes um, in the beam pipe temperature. Um, uh, due to beam, um, uh, uh, beam impacts. Um, for uh, front end and LINAC matching, um, so some of our initial results are shown here. So uh, analysis scanner, um, so this is providing um, one, um, one degree of freedom um, uh, face space scanning. Um, we have two of these arms there, so it's providing um, projections both on the horizontal and the vertical. Um, the matching section through, the, um, through this vertical drop here has a number of profile monitors um, that we are using here. So, this is, so that's showing um, confirmation both in terms of, of simulations and, and measurements um, and then some uh, follow-on measurements with, uh, with, with viewers that are um, interleaved. Uh, in 2018, when we ran uh, experiments through the first three cryo modules, um, kind of shown down here at the bottom, uh, we installed a diagnostic section. This was just a temporary section occupying the position of a, fo of a follow-on cryo module. So this, this, uh, this diagnostic section is no longer there. Um, but again, it provided us confirmation of a number of, uh, number of devices, um, including um, some of our first measurements now of these halo rings, uh, these halo monitoring rings, which are these small um, current intercepting rings we have in between cryo modules, which allows us to look at development of halo or, or beam offsets. Um, as we move through the Linux sections. Um, for the um, superconducting RF Linux commissioning, um, again, we have a number of, um, of, of different sections, both the superconducting sections, there are three of those, um, as well as the warm transport sections in between. 
Um, so we have a number of devices looking at beam intensity. There are, are beam current monitors, which are just based on Burgos ACCTs, uh, a number of Faraday cups, um, uh, low power Faraday cups that we use for, uh, for tuning purposes, and then um, beam position monitors, these button types. Um, we have, uh, so the BPMs do, as you might imagine, a, um, a lot of duty in terms of looking at intensity, look, looking at beam, tr um, 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 beam offsets, transverse offsets, um, as well as phase matching and phase measurements of, of, of the RF beam. Um, uh, our beam profile and, and for lattice tuning, we're again using the profile monitors, the halo rings and the loss monitors. Um, transverse beam emittance, we're using profile monitors in a uh, quad scan formation. Um, a beam a bunch shape monitor um, after the first LINAC section um, provides us with longitudinal bunch measurements um, uh, down to uh, several degrees of phase at 8.5 megahertz. Um, and we also have um, a time in interleave sampling um, um, functionality on our BPM electronics, which allow us to look at the, um, the time in the time domain of the, uh, the bunch spectrum, or the bunch shape. Um, in terms of beam losses, we employ a, a number of neutron detectors, ionization chambers, these halo rings, um, as well as multiple stages of differential beam current monitoring. So these are BCMs that are, uh, that are used on either side of each LINAC segment, um, as well as through some of the warm transport segments. We have uh, 13 BCMs in total, um, and they're analyzed in pairs, um, as well as uh, uh, kind of start, a start to finish uh, measurement for looking at, at uh, low losses. Um, so as, as I was mentioning about the beam position monitors, again, they're, they're in full use. We have a, about 150 uh, 20 millimeter button type. Um, we also have two high aspect ratio shoebox type um, uh, BPMs in the first, uh, in the first bending segment. Um, so they're installed, they're providing data, as, as I mentioned, on position, RF, and time of, uh, RF phase and time of flight measurements. Uh, so a, an offset measurement through the first LINAC segment is, is shown here. Um, we're then tuning through the, um, through the, um, uh, the follow-on um, uh, bending segment is shown, um, is shown following. Um, the RF phase and beam energy measurements are made. Uh, we also analyze multiple RF, RF harmonics uh, to limit crosstalk effects. Uh, we, we specifically don't measure the, or we don't, we, uh, we, we, um, we don't base our measurements on the fundamental harmonic um, of the RF cavities and the cryomodules. We look at the second harmonic um, to, to, again, eliminate um, RF cavity crosstalk measurements. Um, and the, the BPMs were then also used for intensity measurements following the charge stripper. Um, kind of shown here, we were looking at uh, three different charge states uh, during simultaneous acceleration. Uh, we've employed a number of, in, in the last year or so, a number of automatic tuning algorithms. So shown in the upper right is a, um, the results of about a 12-hour shift. So this is one, uh, one shift that we made where, where we were phasing, uh, doing phase studies, um, in the, in the second LINAC segment. So that's several hundred RF cavities that have to be individually tuned. Um, so again, the first time through, it took about 12 hours, of, you know, an entire shift. Um, they gave it, uh, they gave us a, a you know, base amount of information. Um, using the BPMs and the phase measurements um, and that data that we've, we've acquired, we can now retune that cavity um, as we change to different ion species, uh, essentially in a matter of about 20 minutes. Um, and small changes even faster. So, um, that allows us then to, to use the BPMs um, uh, to phase these LINACs very quickly um, to account for certain things. For instance, uh, you know, uh, a failure, uh, a particular cavity failure. So we can retune and rebalance and we can regain the energy after a, a particular cavity has been refailed, has failed and, and then be retuned re 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 uh, in about 10 minutes. Um, and we're looking to improve that down to about one minute um, for, uh, for retuning. Um, and that gets us to an energy difference of about of, of less than 10 kilovolts per, per nucleon based on about 20 MeV, so it's a, it's a very small fraction. Um, of course, trajectory corrections, we're using uh, an orbit response matrix uh, based on, on, on the BPM measurements. Um, so again, that allows us to very quickly tune the transport through these LINAC segments. Um, so we use several types of, of beam loss monitors, as I mentioned before. So our ion chambers, we're using a one and a half liter parallel plate designs, very similar to um, the, the CERN LHC ion chambers, kind of shown here. Um, these are um, these can be pressurized at, at, with different gases and at different um, uh, at different levels. We're currently using uh, nitrogen and argon pressurized to eight or fifteen atmospheres. Um, in different parts of the LINAC. Our neutron monitors are scintillator and PMT based. Uh, the halo monitor rings, kind of shown here in the bottom left, is essentially a small ring of niobium sandwiched between two rings of copper. 
Um, it's biased and acts essentially as a pass-through Faraday cup, um, only, only making measurements when, when we have small beam interceptions due to halo or, or, or beam offsets. Um, and as I also mentioned, we have differential current um, uh, monitors. This provides um, some fast, down to about 15 microseconds of detection, uh, up to slow millisecond to second detection for um, uh, um, various levels of accuracy. Uh, so looking at the, the loss monitors, so we've now um, uh, uh, commissioned our um, accelerator and we're, we're running our first experiments at a one kilowatt beam level, so one kilowatt CW. Um, so in terms of uh, the losses that we've measured, um, with the neutron monitors, we've measured um, uh, flux around the, um, um, around the accelerator complex. Um, kind of shown here um, is the, uh, essentially these large fields, essentially due to neutrons produced during char the charge stripping processes. Um, and then as we have a, a small amount of beam loss around the first bends, we see uh, another pickup of, of, of some. Um, th it's interesting that there is um, this other um, this other pickup at the very low energy side of the LINAC, um, it's, 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 it's only present when beam is sent to LS3, the, the last LINAC segment. So we're actually identifying some losses um, here at the end of the second bend that are picked up with um, neutral monitors at the, um, uh, close to the beginning of the LINAC, uh, LINAC segments. Um, the ion chambers, uh, dose rates again are, you know, kind of show similar type of behavior. Um, the highest dose rates are uh, very close to our, um, our production target, as you might expect. Um, uh, with some crosstalk, um, some areas around the charge stripper. The um, halo rings, kind of shown here, this is showing uh, pickups in terms of picoamperes. Uh, we're running one to two microamperes of, of, of beam current, so this is a very small fraction that is, that is being intercepted. Um, but what's, what's noticeable here is uh, the, the positions of the, uh, of the readbacks. Um, this is showing that we're sensitive to beam transport lattice transitions, so we end up picking up uh, a little bit of beam current as we're changing the lattice, and so um, it's a tuning issue, um, um, and this also allows us a very sensitive monitor um, for um, lattice mismatches and, and uh, beam distribution mis mismatches as we change lattice, um, the lattices from different cryomodule sections or from the warm into the cold sections. Um, now, moving forward into our kind of the target and the uh, rare isotope segment. So after the LINAC, we have a production target, which we then um, produce a large uh, cocktail of rare isotopes. Those isotopes have to be filtered down um, so that we produce only the one that needs to be delivered to an experiment. Um, so there are a suite of detectors and diagnostic systems um, to, um, to, to assist us in that matter. There is, first off, there is a, a, a production target, which, you know, at, at at full beam energy, we'll be intercepting 400 kilowatts of beam, um, as well as a beam dump um, and a beam wedge. Then there's a vertical pre-separator where we start to um, um, separate a large number of the cocktails from the ones that we, that we want. Um, and then finally, we're into a basically a low, um, uh, very low power section, but a very high count rate. So, so um, here we're looking at isotope productions um, in the kilohertz to, to megahertz regime. So a number of diagnostic stations have been installed along this fragment separator area. Um, kind of one is shown here and uh, shown below. Um, it's instrumented with a number of devices, including uh, parallel plate avalanche counters, these PPACs. These are essentially profile monitors. They're looking um, at the beam distribution. Um, uh, there are slit sections, time of flight um, um, detectors based on uh, fast um, uh, scintillators and, and photomultiplier tubes. Um, silicon stack detectors um, for total energy and as well as uh, changes in energy, um, and then a large uh, thick scintillator um, and, and PMT system for uh, time of flight and total energy. Um, this section has to manage uh, the, the 400 kilowatts of primary beam as well as um, up to very high rep rates and very high uh, production rates for secondary beams. Um, so our, kind of our first stop here is in the target and the beam dump area. Um, where we have installed a thermal imaging system on the target. We have a, another thermal imaging system somewhat similar um, um, going in with the beam dump. Um, the thermal imaging system is based on a, uh, a double telescope design where we have a single mirror looking at the, at the target. There's a, actually, it's, there's a, there's a pass-through mirror um, for the beam to come through um, that directs then uh, light through a double telescope, uh, a dog leg section to uh, an optical station on top um, of the main vacuum chamber for the beam dump on the beam target. 
Um, the kind of layout is shown here. We have uh, beam splitters, and then there's an uh, IR as well as visible camera. Um, and then we also split into two photodiodes that are used for fast um, uh, op optical pyrometry, looking at the, essentially the health and the status of the, of the target itself, and that's then attached to fast MPS systems. We've, um, we've calibrated the, the system in situ. Um, essentially, we lowered a, um, a black body source into the, um, into the, target, uh, in the, into the target vessel, um, you know, basically behind the first um, uh, section where the target would be, and allows us to um, calibrate in situ um, the cameras. And so basically, a, a, a sample is shown here that we've used. Um, so that then now gives us a uh, calibration up through, you know, several, uh, well, up to about 1,200, 1,400 degrees um, Celsius, um, and that covers our, our range um, that, we, that we anticipate um, uh, at our current levels, our current power levels. Um, initial thermal imaging results are shown here. Um, so this is um, one of our last experiments. This is, shows uh, where we had a primary beam of, of, of 70 zinc. Um, about 922 watts CW beam onto a static target, um, and then just showing the, the results. This is the, the thermal imaging um, camera uh, looking at about one micron uh, radiation, and that's showing the, uh, essentially the beam spot. The, the target itself is essentially it's about, this, about this large. Um, image analysis is showing the, um, the image, uh, the, the spot size of about 0.2 millimeters RMS X and Y. Um, which conforms with um, um, our transport results um, and, our, and what we're predicting. So then moving on into uh, the fragment separator area, as I mentioned, so these, these two um, boxes are shown um, are two example um, uh, diagnostic chambers that we use along the fragment separator, um, which have a, as I described uh, previously, a number of, um, of installed devices. Uh, some of these are, are actuated. Actually, all of, them, all of these are actuated. Um, there are some set slits in here, but most of, most of the slits are, are positionable and, and uh, movable remotely. Um, dual um, parallel plates, or PPACs, are used, as I, as, I, as I mentioned, both for profile monitoring as well as for offset and angle. Um, so we use that for momentum corrections um, in our um, in the transport lines, uh, time of flight scintillators and photomultiplier tubes are shown here, viewer and camera, um, as well as resolving slits um, and a, uh, an energy, to, um, uh, energy resolving wedge. Um, so kind of if for people that are not familiar with the, with the methodology, um, when we produce uh, the large set of fragments um, uh, from our target, we're basically producing everything in, you know, in a large range um, 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 of atomic and, and nuclear species, um, as you go through um, basically this, this B row and, and, and delta E type of measurement system um, in a dispersive beam line plus slits plus um, dispersive wedges, um, you're actually then able to narrow down the, um, uh, the cocktail until you just have the, um, um, the, the isotope of interest. Um, so as I mentioned last year, uh, at the end of the last calendar year, we produced our first rare isotope um, using this method. Um, with, um, with the effort accelerator. This is a method that's been in, um, in production elsewhere as well as, well as at MSU. Um, and so this is uh, showing generation using a uh, stable um, 86 krypton beam to generate a, an, um, a rare um, uh, selenium 84 beam. Um, so this is um, basically showing the um, data collected through the time of flight uh, and energy loss method, um, you know, methods into a stack of silicon detectors. Um, which, which remains our primary means of tuning this beam line um, um, prior to basically removing the um, intercepting diagnostics and delivering beam to experimenters. Um, so as I mentioned, our experimental program has begun. Um, we've um, uh, now run three experiments starting um, uh, May earlier this year where the primary beams are shown here, um, calcium-48, selenium-82, and zinc-70. Uh, where we produce rare isotopes, uh, sodium-37, potassium-54, and iron-64. Um, the um, fragment separator and, and, and analyzing beam line is this, this first major bend. Uh, the isotopes are then um, confirmed at the basically diagnostic box five, which is shown with, where the arrow is, and then delivered to one of the experiments. So one of the first experiments was just a, um, a fast decay, um, a fast decay station. Um, our second experiment was then along um, this, this so-called S2 beam line to our S800 spectrograph, um, which is then um, instrumented with um, 
ionization chambers, um, uh, 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 CRDC, um, as well as time of flight ionization chambers. So looking, um, looking forward now, where we wish to go in terms of developing new instrumentation capabilities at, at FRIB. Um, so in terms of our primary beam, we have um, um, work underway right now for multiplexing our Faraday cup electronics so that we can, we can look at both production beams as well as, as some of our pilot beams, so extending our dynamic range um, uh, for Faraday cups and similar types of devices. Um, we have a, um, oops, uh, an MOU with a Brazilian light source uh, to develop one of these open hardware boards um, shown here on the, on the right um, um, to um, basically improve our, um, our resolution and our response um, and our ability to manage our now larger BCM network, our current monitor networks um, for differential beam current monitoring. Um, our loss monitor network, um, we are um, um, improving the network in terms of adding additional diagnostics, um, um, uh, new ionization chambers, as well as neutron monitors, which, are, um, which have shown um, a fair degree of, uh, of capability in this machine, um, and then trying to tie these together um, um, in the network and our data acquisition and processing system um, to improve our predictive capabilities for, uh, for beam losses. Uh, a gas sheet profile monitor, um, I have a student working on, on that, very similar to um, basically the, the low intensity gas sheets that we've seen um, in this community in the last couple of years. Um, on the secondary beam lines, uh, we're developing a larger, uh, larger format up to about 20 by 20 centimeter um, squared uh, P-packs. Um, we need to improve our detection rates up to, up to megahertz level, so we're going into, uh, we're, we're further developing more optical techniques, including um, optical-based PPACs, um, and then our, our what's called our E-loss detector. So this is a, uh, an energy loss detector based on uh, gaseous uh, xenon. Um, and then, so kind of shown over here, there's a, um, the arrow will follow me, um, a volume of gaseous xenon surrounded by essentially a, you know, a, this, this network of, of small um, uh, rectangular PMTs. Uh, so that is in development now. We've just uh, submitted a paper to review of scientific instrumentation, and we, this, uh, we intend to um, uh, demonstrate this on a beam line, probably a 20 MeV per nucleon beam line later this year. Um, we also are con um, um, participate in a number of, of, of collaborations to develop fast electronic systems for detector readout. Um, again, trying to improve our, our measurement capabilities into the megahertz regime. So with that, um, so we've um, just to summarize, we've, um, all of our LINAC diagnostic sections have been commissioned, um, and, that, and they've supported our uh, LINAC commissioning up to 200 MeV per nucleon, um, and now we're moving into the regime of, of, of ramping our power up. Um, we started at, at one kilowatt um, this year. Uh, later in this year, our next stage is three kilowatts, and then in, uh, in the next calendar year, we'll be looking at, at five and then 10 kilowatts uh, by this time in 2023. Um, and our diagnostic and detector development continues to support uh, high beam power and high particle rates. So on that, got a minute left, Peter. <laughs> well, thank you. No. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very, very good overview. And I have to say, I gratulate you to your, to your fast commissioning. In particular, I know as working also in an iron facility, what it means to run different iron beams. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so really, gratulation. <laughs> um, are there, we, we have a couple of, of minutes for questions. Uh, is there one? Whatever there. Yeah, okay, I can't see it from here. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, for your thermal imaging, what is the uh, material, and what's the damage threshold? That we're using for uh, what, what, what is actually doing, this, uh, doing the, the emission in this installation is our target. So we're actually looking at the, the thermal signature. So the material itself is, is it's either carbon or beryllium, our target material. Um, and so that has you know, particular emissivities, um, you know, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, depending on where, where, um, which material we're looking at. Um, the, the optics themselves are standard optics, um, and then we just filter into the two different um, uh, wave, wavelength channels. Um, our beam dump, um, I didn't show any, any results on the, on the beam dump right now, but we have a similar system that's looking at 10 micron radiation. Um, uh, the target there is a, 
um, basically a tungsten, tungsten donut filled with water, so we're looking at the, the thermal signature on, on the tungsten. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, is there a further question? I have one, uh, if, if there's nothing. Uh, Steve, you, you have BPMs in the, in the warm and in the cryogenic region. Yeah. Uh, is there a big difference concerning its mechanical construction? Uh, no, no. So we've used uh, we use the same construction um, of, of BPMs in the, in the cold and the warm section. Um, what is what is interesting um, is our uh, essentially our calibration. So we use uh, a large network of BPMs for time of flight measurements. Uh, the warm BPMs we can access uh, with our survey equipment. Uh, the cold BPMs we cannot because they're inside the uh, the cryo modules, of course. Um, and so that means that there's a little bit more uncertainty on the longitudinal position of the cryogenic BPMs, um, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we compensate for that with, uh, with beam-based alignment techniques. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good. Some further comments or questions to, 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 to this talk? Then, then, then I think we thank the speaker again. Thank you. The next speaker... <laughs> Uh, it's Natalia Milas. Um, she's talking also on, on commissioning and uh, calculations related at ESS. Um, she did her PhD uh, in, in the Brazilian light source for longitudinal dynamics investigations. Um, and then she worked at, at RIC and uh, PSI for several topics on, 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 on beam dynamics. Uh, and in the last four, five years, she worked uh, in the, in the uh, physics group at ESS contributing to the, to the recent commissioning, um, and she's also involved in the muon collider business. Um, and I have to say I have some problems here, which are solved with a timer. Sorry. So please start. Can I yes. start? Okay. Uh, for first, I would like to thank for the opportunity. So I'm going to present uh, about uh, beam tuning studies. More actually is us trying to make sense of the beam that we are transporting now. Uh, for those that don't know, ESS is a spallation source that is being built in the south of Sweden. Uh, the final uh, power for, uh, is 5 megawatts and is driven by a proton linac. So here in the picture you can see the, the campus. The linac is this part here. And here we have the target building. And uh, for the linac, uh, it's a 600 meters more or less machine, and we have now about uh, 15 meters installed and commissioned. So on the commissioning that we had so far, so we are commissioning the machine in stages. Uh, between 2018 and 2019, we commissioned the source in the first uh, low energy transport section. Then we had quite a gap, and in 2021, uh, we commission mainly the RFQ, although we are transporting the beam to the Mabit Farday Cup. Uh, here you can see this is the very first beam passing through the, the RFQ uh, and all the way to, to the Mabit Farday Cup. And this was uh, at, uh, at the end of 2021. We had a short uh, shutdown. In the beginning of uh, February of 2022, we came back uh, and continue the commissioning. So the first part of the commissioning was extremely focused on RFQ and the transmission. And the second part, then we started uh, bringing back live more instrumentation in the MEBIT area. Uh, and uh, the second, second commissioning or third commissioning that happened actually uh, uh, this year, uh, the first half of this year, uh, we, we, we seen the uh, wires coming back, coming live in the MEBIT. We also turned on the bunch of cavities, and we also passed being through the DTL. So the first DTL tank was installed after the MEBIT, and we could, could pass being through the DTL. And we passed the first beam through the DTL, which was a five microsecond, six milliamp beam, so quite small beam, in June. It's here, actually, the first plot. And then one month later, we managed to, uh, to transmit also a high current beam. So the design current for ESS is 62 milliamp, and we managed to, to transmit all the, all the way to the end of the first tank uh, the design current, in also, but also a short pulse, 
we are not really, we cannot uh, pass yet uh, long pulses. The, the, the bean dumps, they, they cannot take it. So we are going in steps. And here you can see one of the first uh, 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 phase scans that we had in the bunchers and also in the DTL. And there is more, oops, there is more about the, the phase scans in the poster on Tuesday and also about timing in another poster also on Tuesday. So uh, let's take a look at what we have in the MEBIT. So the MEBIT uh, is, a, is a short transport section between the RFQ and the first DTL tank. We have 11 quadrupoles, and inside seven of them, we have BPMs, strip line BPMs. Uh, we also have uh, two beam current monitors, so two toroids, and one Faraday cup. So the first, uh, first BCM is here, the second BCM is here, but we also have a BCM at the interface between the, the RFQ to, to the MEBIT. Uh, we have uh, three wire scanners that you can see here in light blue and uh, an emittance uh, unit, or a slit and grid unit for horizontal and vertical. And we sh we, in the design, we should have a bunch-shaped monitor, but this one is heavily delayed, so we don't have any, anything even installed yet. And we also have uh, three buncher cavities that are used for focusing and, uh, and uh, matching the beam into the DTL. So... First measurements that we did, this was uh, uh, in, the, in the very first uh, commissioning where we were focusing on the RFQ, was to measure the energy, uh, the output energy of the RFQ. We don't have a, a spectrometer line or anything like that uh, uh, foreseen. So we did time of flight measurements with the two, two BPMs around the middle part of the MEBIT. They were uh, calibrated, uh, the cable distance and delays, they were uh, 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 measured. And uh, so the energy that we measured for, for the RFQ output beam was 3.6 MeV, which is in line with the, the expected, this 3.62 MeV was the design energy and the, with a, a 100 kV uh, error bar. Once the cavities came, uh, okay, we could put uh, power into the, the buncher cavities, then we start uh, trying uh, phase scans. The phase scans that we did so far, were, were, they were quite manual. We do have scripts, we can run it, but since we are not used yet to the system, and actually the system changed a lot through, through the commissioning, so we had to, to adapt. So they were, they were very manual. We are not doing things uh, extremely automatic, aut automatic yet. And we are trying to also to understand or, or choose the best parameters. And once we have that, then, then we're going to kick in more automatic scans. So uh, first thing that we did, of course, was to calibrate and to, to check amplitudes against simulation so we could start trying to understand what, what's going on with the beam itself once we start looking at uh, or comparing uh, with simulation. So we, manage, we, have, we have the calibration of the three bunch of cavities. There is a poster on Tuesday, as I said, talking a lot more about uh, uh, analysis and techniques that we use to, to, to check amplitude calibration for, for the MEBIT. So the first step was trying to take a look at the longitudinal, continue in the longitudinal, but we didn't have a, a, a bunch-shaped monitor, so what we did is actually we tried to use the BPM data. So if you look at the sum signal of the BPM, it is uh, dependent on a bunch of factors, a form factor that uh, it depends on your BPM, charge, and other factors that you can add here. But it's also going to vary uh, with the, the pulse length or the, the bunch length in your machine. So I have a ton of assumptions here. But one of them, for example, is I'm assuming all the BPMs have the same form factor. They are the same. They were uh, in the MEBIT. I talked to the, to the diagnostic group. Calibrations were done also before on the gains of those, uh, those signals. And then what I, we, I decided to do is that uh, I got uh, the BPM some signals for the case where we didn't have the bunchers yet, so we have quite strong debunching through the MEBIT. So a very large variation in the signal, the sum signal. And then basically I tried to fit the input or the, the, the input twist, launch no twist, in order to fit, this, oops, to fit this dependence. If I push it too hard, it goes. 
Uh, and this is the first plot here. Uh, in the same plot, you can see the, the, the fit, that's the full line, and the dashed line is what we actually expected to have. So that's the design. If I use all the design parameters, what we expect to come out of the RFQ, it should be this, uh, this dashed line here. So for sanity check, I tune buncher one only in a bunching phase and debunching phase and check the, the BPMs again. So here you can see the red one is for bunching, so nine, minus 90 degree in, in design amplitude. Then I swap to the debunching phase, 90 degrees, uh, with the same amplitude, and I got the sum signals of the BPMs again. And again here, the, the, the full line uses the, the, the input twist that I got from the, the minimization here, and the dashed line are the design parameters. So, uh, obviously, or most likely, we are not in the design parameters. Maybe the fit has some shortcomings, which I'm going to discuss later on. But uh, yeah, probably much more to one side than another. I kept going. I want to buncher two, so I, 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 uh, we, we, we froze buncher one in the bunching phase. Design amplitude went to buncher two. I actually, I, I, I swapped the plots. This is for buncher one. This is for buncher two. And uh, this is more like sanity check to see if the, uh, 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 it was likely to have these results here, or if these results here would make any sense. Because as you can see, I put on the side the design, uh, design values that we expected, and uh, the fit values, they are quite off. So this is what we got for the longitudinal. So I, I assume that we are closer to the fit to the parameters that I got from the fit, for some reason our emittance is, is smaller, quite smaller than we expected. But I assume that we are closer to this than to the design. And I kept going, and now we're going to the transverse. So I could grab these values and fit into, into the transverse. So as I said, we have three wires in the MEBIT. So at three positions, and uh, this again, uh, we measure the sigma or the, the RMS for each each of them, and here is one example. So dots are measurements, dashed lines are Gaussian fits. And then I use the same minimization uh, trying to figure out what is the input parameters here in the MEBIT in order to get this uh, dependence on the, on the uh, bunch size or uh, bunch RMS size. And uh, here is the result from the fit. And again, uh, we have a much, uh, again, oh no, actually, uh, uh, contrary to the longitudinal, looks like our emittance in the transverse is way bigger. Twists are also off. In the, in the horizontal plane, the fit is a bit better. In the, in the, in the Y plane, the errors are quite large. It's hard to say uh, if, 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 uh, if, if I can draw any big conclusion about the, the Y. So the funny optics here, actually, uh, is because these measurements with the three wires, we only had the three wires working before we have buncher cavities, EMUs, and anything online. And at that point, uh, we couldn't, uh, we were taking care not to focus the beam on the Faraday cup. The Faraday cup was being used as beam dump. So we actually only had the first three quads in the MEBIT here turned on. All the other quads were off. That's why the, the beam size uh, explodes at the end. And we have these funny optics. Unfortunately, after this measurement and in the next commissioning steps that we had, either one of the wires were not working, or we had issues with motion control, or at some point, the wires can three and the emittance unit, they, they share the same position. And in order to avoid collision, we had to unplug the wire three, so we couldn't run them at the same time. So at the very, very end of the, of the commissioning stage, we managed to get the EMU units working, and we measure with them. Uh, uh, actually, this measurement here is the last day, and uh, if, you, if you look closely, we have uh, half of the measurement and high resolution. The rest of the measurement, we had to reduce the resolution uh, to be able to, to fit in the time scale. But what is uh, interesting in this measurement is that the values for the emittance that we got from the EMU are not so far off from the ones we got from the fit. And we again have a, a transverse emittance that is 
fairly larger than what we expected. So we started looking like what could have happened or why are we so far in both, both in, in all the three planes. So for the longitudinal plane, uh, there is a lot of unknowns and it's hard to get, uh, the, it's gonna be hard to get correct results without the bunch shape monitor. For the, for the BPMs, I already discussed with the diagnostics. We're gonna take a look again at this cable calibration to be sure that we don't have any weird offset or gain, gain pro, gains that we are not accounting for. Uh, also, I used in the, in the fits, I was using envelope and uh, yeah, it might be just too simplistic and I should maybe go to a fancier model or particle tracking to do the fits. And uh, uh, we have one fast BPM in the middle of the Mabit where we can uh, take a look at the, at the signal in the time domain and, and, and get a, a better estimate for the, the, post, the bunch length at that point and then compare also with the fits and this is ongoing. Uh, another thing that we, can, we should be more careful is that uh, uh, here is, uh, is an example. This is the, the amplitude inside the RFQ, the red one without the beam, the blue one with a two microsecond, uh, three milliamp beam, and uh, we have to be careful that uh, we, we are not one with the, throughout the pulse seeing different amplitudes and then the, uh, uh, messing up the, the beam in the longitudinal direction here. So the RFQ, we started using feedback and adaptive feed forward, I think in the third step when everything came uh, on, on, online. So this is one. For the trans S plane, again, no Gaussian beams that we can have, uh, envelope mode. But one of the main things is that for the, especially for the long pulse, this is one example, this is a 20 microsecond pulse measured at the BPM two in the Mabit. Uh, especially if you look at the vertical plane, we have excursions intra-pulse that, that are about one millimeter. And uh, well, b basically we are painting the beam there on the wire. So we have to find, uh, figure out how to get these guys flatter. And uh, there is some dependence with the settings in the, in the, in the Labit. And we have another issue. Uh, during the, the Labit commissioning, we had an EMU there. We did a lot of experiments. But turn out that once we open the, the, the source, the repeller of the source was never connected. So all the measurements that we did in the first measurement campaign that we had uh, characterizing the Labit, uh, well, it's it gone. We have to redo it. So we, we actually don't know exactly what is going through the Labit into the RFQ, so it's hard to do simulations from beginning to end to see what we get. So conclusions or outlook more. Uh, we have the beam through the RFQ and the TL with good transmission, and it actually have good transmission even with the beam with all these weird parameters. I try to, trans to, to see if uh, I would have big losses maybe, but actually I can pass through everything. So it doesn't help to look at transmission of the DTL to give me any insight if my fitted parameters are completely wrong or not. So maybe we do have a big beam. Uh, Commissioning and initial test of most diagnostics is done in the MABIT, but we have to fine tune diagnostics. As I said, the, emittance, the emit, horizontal emittance unit came, uh, we managed to use it in the very last day, so we need more time to make it more automatic. It's also st still very manual. And we have quite some steps that we need to fulfill in order to be able to understand beam dynamics and the beam quality that we are transmitting through the Mabit. And this is important because I don't think the last, next DTL, DTL2, is gonna be as forgiving as the first one. So we have to, 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 to get these optics sorted in the Mabit. And for that, too, yeah, as I said, uh, recharacterize the Mabit, check BPMs, uh, we have iris also, so we have to do further studies when we close the iris very much, which kind of beam we are passing through when we want to reduce current. And uh, we need EMU that uh, we have better settings, cor cross-correlate the results with the, 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 the wires that we never managed to do. Uh, and also make sure that we have beam position that is stable pulse po by pulse and intra-pulse as well, because we, we did see some huge excursions inside. And, and that's it, and uh, I would like to thank you all.
Yes. Thank you very much for this, for this interesting talk and uh, that you showed us the, the actual situation at, at ESS. I think that's because uh, there are quite a lot of open topics. Are there some comments and, and, and questions to, to this talk? I have a mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Uh, I, I have um, two very quick questions. One, I didn't uh, fully understand why you cannot as, um, accelerate a long pass for the moment. Was oh. Uh, we we uh, the far they, the, we are using far day cup as beam dumps and they have a limitation. So we can either go long pulse and low current, or the design current and very short pulses. They cannot take the power. Ah, okay, and then to go further, you you will have temporary dumps at this energy. We or? have we have a temp we have a, a temporary or a, a dump that can take a bit uh, more power in the spoke session. And uh, maybe in the medium beta section, okay. but uh, I think the full power only at the final dump. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think you partially answered uh, because uh, you said that the emittance meter you could use uh, only at the very end. But if you take, uh, uh, you, you have a plot where you show the wire scanner results, yes. where you have the beam sizes uh, as function of the position. So yes. yeah, this one. So if you pro if you project uh, your uh, uh, phase space. Uh, of the ellipse uh, uh, measured with the emittance meter on this plot, uh, it is. Uh, did you try? It is sitting. So it is agrees with the wire scanners, more or less, or not? Because yeah, for, for I didn't put it because for the this one, it's uh, the the measurements that we did during the the time that we are have, we are dumping the beam in the Faraday cup in the Mabit. So the the they they we were asked not to to focus so i couldn't use the the correct optics ah, okay, for the yeah. emu I, I we could because we had the slit so we okay, were cutting okay. a lot of the beam okay thanks okay is there a further question here uh, natalia uh, thanks a lot for a nice talk i have a question what is the size of a beam compared to the y scan the diameter first and second if in the fit project procedure did you consider instead of uh, a Gauss fit to con uh, fit that cons that uh, include the convolution of a Gaussian profile with a distribution of the of uh. the of a y that give uh, an error function uh, like uh, fitting function. No, uh, for, uh, for the fitting, I didn't do anything too fancy. I, I still okay. have to go back to the data and 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 and. and have more time looking at it. For the wire, I, I unfortunately I cannot answer the question, but I can take a look. Yeah, I see. I think it's important to say when the wire become comparable to the, yes, the diameter yes. to the to the beam, uh, say a no, simple I, I, Gauss I fit. I think our beam is quite uh, some, quite com large yeah, compared to simple, the wire, but I, yeah. I, I just me. A simple guessing. Gauss fit does, doesn't work uh, yeah. so well. Thanks. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. So. Okay. <laughs> So we move on in the, in the program. Uh, the next is uh, some consideration for forecasting problems or, or faults. Um, the talk is given by Zichem Lee. Um, she is a, a PhD student at uh, PSI in, and uh, ETH uh, Zurich. Um, and her research interest lies in, in uh, simulations and accelerator physics and as well as machine learning. Um, she has uh, a bachelor degree from University uh, Beijing in China and a master uh, done in, in Zurich. Um, she also enjoyed singing. <laughs> okay, please. Thank you for the nice introduction. And um, yeah, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to speak in such a wonderful conference and also come to Krakow to visit. So um, now I start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Su Chen Li. I'm uh, from China and uh, studying at PSI. And today my topic is uh, novel approaches for forecasting of beam interruptions in particle accelerators, basically, at PSI. So this is my outline for today. First, I will give you an introduction of the, our machine, HIPAA, and also the problem formulation. And then I will go through two models that we tried and uh, did a model comparison. And uh, also, I will talk to you about our custom uh, real-time metrics of how to compare those models. 
and then come to some potential instrumentations to realize such a forecasting model, and in the end, give conclusion and outlook. So first uh, introduction of high intensity proton accelerators, HIPAA at PSI. Maybe some of you already very familiar with it. Uh, so yeah, the first part is uh, Crowcroft Walton that uh, pre-accelerate uh, delivers the beam to 870 keV. And after that, uh, the beams are uh, going to this uh, injector 2 cyclotron, uh, which has uh, energy up to 72 MeV uh, with a beam current of 2.2 mm, milli, yeah, milli And then after that, uh, it is the most important ring cyclotron that accelerate the beam further to 590 MeV with a power up to 1.4 megawatts. And this number actually makes HIPAA one of the most powerful uh, proton accelerators in the whole world. And after that, we come to the target stations that splits the thing into seven different beam lines. And in the end, we have very uh, important two experimental areas. The first one is the UCN source, and the second one is the SYNQ, Spallation Neutron Source at PSI. So in my study, I just focus on this part, the ring cyclotron and the proton channels uh, to the target stations. And so an introduction of the interlock system. Um, in HIPAA, in the, basically this focused region, uh, there are a lot of different types of monitors, including temperature, uh, magnet currents, and beam loss monitors, the most important one, and also beam position monitors, and so on. And uh, with all these monitors, we collect the signals uh, constantly, and all of them are input into such an interlock system. And by doing that, uh, it means that once, for example, the beam loss monitors has uh, exceed the safety, safety limit, the interlock system would be triggered, and then uh, the beam would be shut off. Uh, so in this whole process, would equivalently lose 25 seconds of beam time. And this is what we want to reduce. So uh, we propose to build a forecasting model on top of the interlock system. Yeah, so that uh, the signals are first uh, input into the forecasting model. If the model tells us there is an interlock going to happen, we propose to trigger some recover operation back onto the machine to replace the previously shut off of the beam. And in this, uh, uh, by doing that, interlocks may be avoided and the whole operation would be more stable. So now uh, comes to the problem formulation. So uh, our aim is to forecast the interlocks at HIPAA, and our input is so-called the channels that are signals of five hertz from all the monitors of HIPAA, and there are totally 376 of them. Um, our target is just uh, interlocks, which are beam interruptions of HIPAA. And here you can see an example. So there are only three channels I listed here, bending magnet temperature and the beam current. And this is an example interlock, would, uh, which just shut up the beam. And then uh, gradually it will ramp up again. So this process would lose equivalently 25 seconds of beam. So how we formulate the problem? We just uh, treat such a forecasting problem into binary classification. So mm, the meaning is that we take two classes of samples. The positive class means unstable, and the negative class means stable. So um, we actually, there are two things that we can tune. One thing is the time of advanced alarm. So this is yeah, as big as, as possible, that is better. And also, the other thing is the sample length. So we can take the shortest sample length would be 0 0.2 seconds, right? because we have 5 hertz of beam. And this is also tunable in our model. So now I will introduce you um, briefly our first model that is already published. Um, so it is called uh, Recurrence Plot Convolutional Neural Network. 
Um, it is quite a complex model uh, in terms of, uh, so first, the first step is to take the two classes, as I just mentioned, uh, from, the, yeah, from the time, uh, and uh, each, each sample has the size of 376, which are the number of inputs, and also a tunable sample length. As shown here, you can see the different color of windows. And then the second step is to transform each of the one-dimensional time series into a two-dimensional so-called recurrence plot. So this is, um, yeah, this part shown here. So each of the one-dimensional time series is transformed into a two-dimensional plot, which can be understood as a, this, a, a difference matrix of the one-dimensional time series. And uh, why we do that is because we want to make use of the very powerful convolutional neural network that is uh, very um, famous for its ability to do image processing. And so in the end, um, in the, in the end, the, out, the output would be just one score, one probability score inside zero to one, uh, which indicates the probability that uh, this sample belongs to the interlock class. So you can see that this model is quite complex, um, but actually uh, the performance is not so as desired. Uh, we have a very high false positive rate. So we want to understand why uh, such a complex model doesn't work so well. Uh, so we did a very detailed study of the data. And here you can see we tried a two sample test from statistics, uh, which means that we statistically compare the so-called maximum mean discrepancy uh, of the samples taken at T0 and T1, which are just two time, uh, fixed time before all the interlocks. So as shown here, uh, let's say we take T1 to be 0 0.2 seconds and we fix T0 to be 10 seconds. So this means that we take all the samples that are 0 0.2 seconds before the interlocks, group them into a set, uh, this orange set here, and then we also take all the samples that are 10 seconds before all the interlocks, uh, which are the green set. So then we statistically compare the distribution of these two sets to uh, calculate their discrepancy. And from this calculation, we actually find that you can see the, the plot here. This means that we compare the 10 second set uh, with all the sets from 10 seconds up to 0 0.2 seconds before the interlock. And this is in log scale. So actually, it means that only at 0 0.2 seconds before the interlocks, there are some uh, different that, that is visible. So it, it means that essentially there's no gradual change and the change is basically very abrupt, only happened at 0 0.2 seconds before the interlocks. And so that actually is, explains why we didn't have a very good performance before because previously the positive class is taken uh, one second before the interlocks. So that actually we failed to capture the difference. So now since we discovered that only 0 0.2 seconds is different. We just simply change our positive and negative class. So we take our positive class only 0 0.2 seconds before, and we take our negative class as 10 seconds before the interlocks. So we just do a very simple linear uh, lasso model uh, with uh, such input. Uh, this input are the vector input of 376 as I mentioned before, and the labels are just binary labels of plus and minus one, and we want to fit a weight uh, to minimize the loss that uh, is composed of, uh, the first part is the logistic loss uh, that is standard for binary classification, and then the second part is a regularization part with lambda control uh, that controls the strength of the regularization. We choose lasso because we have such a huge input space and we want to do some feature selection uh, automatically. And this model is simple, linear, and sparse, which promotes its interpretability. And the output is still a probability output inside zero and one. So here comes the model comparison of the two models. And uh, in terms of this uh, so-called receiver operating characteristic curve, that is the standard metric for binary classification tasks. 
Um, and so you can see that uh, this means uh, since the y-axis is the true positive rate and x X axis is false positive rate. It's, it means that a point that is higher uh, upper left is better. So you can see that the red line is the perfect model, and the black dashed line is random guess. And clearly, Lasso outperforms the previous RPC in, in both in terms of classification power and in terms of stable performance. Um, since our aim is not only just to compare the previous, previously taken test set, but to actually put it in real-time uh, implementation, we need to come up with our own custom real-time metric of what is uh, in real-time true positive and what is in real-time false positive. So we actually define it like this. Uh, we have defined a one-minute inspection window. And you can see, for example, we take this. Um, and this blue point means that the model says, okay, there is an interlock coming. And from this part, we look one minute in the future to see that if there is no interlock uh, in one minute after the model reports an interlock, this is counted as a false positive. But in the other hand, if an interlock really comes inside one minute after the report, then this is counted as a true positive. So in this case, we can define our uh, beam time saved TS in any given time. Uh, and so according to the number of true positive and false positives uh, detected in any given time range. And the, the number 19 and 6 are coming from the experts. So here now we compare these two models based on our custom metric. Um, so you can clearly see that we uh, take two months uh, of data which contains around 1,200 interlocks in total. And the Lasso model clearly outperforms RPC in, in terms of the number of true positives detected and also the number of false positives that uh, reduced. And actually the previous model lose around 10 minutes of beam time per day. And while the new model has successfully achieved around six minutes of beam time saved per day. And here is also a comparison of around uh, one hour time that contains two interlocks. And you can also see that the new Lasso model has far less false positives than the previous model. And I want to point something interest, interesting here. So you can see this point, yeah. And this point is counted as a false positive only because we define our inspection window to be one minute. So if we actually increase our inspection window to, for example, I think in this case, two minutes, then this point, this blue point here, would actually be a very nice earlier alarm of the interlock. So the definition, a proper definition of uh, in real time of how to evaluate the model is still something we are trying to do. Yes. And now comes some potential instrumentation, maybe more interesting for you, uh, for our recover operation. So um, it is suggested by the experts that to avoid an interlock, uh, if we reduce 10% of the beam current, uh, it might be possible. So in our case, uh, our beam current uh, is around two milliampere. So it means that we need to reduce 0.2 milliampere of beam current inside this 200 millisecond of time scale, according to the Lasso model. And here I listed some possible uh, instrumentations that can realize such a task. So uh, this one is uh, what triggers the interlock. So this is uh, listed here as a reference. And all the others are able to do that inside this 200 millisecond. Um, and uh, only the last one, the collimator, gives me a speed kind of uh, number. That, uh, so to reduce such amount of current, it needs around uh, 60 millisecond of time. Um, yeah, so with all this, um, yeah, I'm also very interested to know more uh, about such uh, instrumentations that are able to do very fast adjustment of beam current. 
Okay, so here comes my conclusion. Um, so we formulate the forecasting problem of interlocks into binary classification. And our first RPCN model that is very complex, it transforms one dimensional time series to two dimensional images. Uh, it, is, uh, it should be powerful, but it doesn't really come to our expectation. And we have very high false positives. And uh, in the end, we realize that we actually have improper input of this model. And the next step is we did this two sample MMD test, which shows that beam interruptions are more abrupt than gradual. And so after that, we use this uh, lasso model that outperforms the previous RPCN in both classification and real time metrics. And uh, for some outlook is some further experiment on real-time implementation on specific different types of interlocks and also the, the realization of the recover operations are ongoing. So yeah, here are the references. And with that, I'd like to thank all the uh, co-authors and uh, supervisors and also all of you for your listening. Thank you very much for this, for this nice talk showing these new methods we, we, we have to use for uh, pro protecting our accelerators. Are there some comments and questions? There's one over there by Rudy Rudolf. So from the 376 signals, probably not all are really important. So have, have you an idea how much are really going into interlock forecasting, so which, is, which are sensitive for this? Ah, uh, yes. So this is actually why we use Lasso to select the input. So in the end, uh, I think the really important channels are only around 100, so out of 300, yeah. Mm -hmm. And those are loss monitors or mm -hmm. others? Only loss monitors? Um, not only loss monitors. I would say the loss monitors are most important, but there are also something comes from electrostatic elements and something comes from the transmission line. So, but yeah, I need to check further, yes. Mm -hmm. So when the operators tune the machine, Mm -hmm. They look mostly at the loss monitors, and there are warning levels. So they, mm -hmm. uh, if things develop slowly, they see that if a warning level is reached, OK, maybe they, they do this um, lowering of beam cu current also. But can you compare your method to what would happen if you just look at the loss monitors, and if the warning levels are reached, you reduce the beam current? Mm, we are, yeah, we have planned such uh, uh, experiments, actually. So actually, we have created some interlocks by tuning the collimators. And then, um, uh, so that is why we have such a suggestion of reducing 10% of the beam current that could uh, avoid the interlock. And, and this is what we did by creating it and then reducing the current. So um, I would say, mm, the methods are different, but we need to com we need to yeah just compare it afterwards, like um, with con so confine the type of interlocks to only the loss type, yeah. So but, now but, this. But with the data you have, you already could look what happens if I if I see that the interlock level comes close to the warning level that I then decrease the current by ten percent. Would it have ha have helped or not? OK. It would definitely be helpful. And so in this model, uh, we didn't really include the, the warning levels. So this is something we uh, choose not to include, because we want to just let the model learn that um, in, an, in, in what circumstances would it be out of the safety limit. So, and I think, yeah, definitely, if we know already beforehand where is the safety limit, we would give the model, uh, yeah, more things to learn, and it will definitely uh, make the alarm a bit more earlier than what is currently now. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> there is no further urgent question. Let's thank the speaker again. Mm -hmm.
And now we are coming to the special session for the Faraday Cup Award. And, and for this, I ask uh, Ia Lobach, uh, Kevin Jordan, and Adriana to come to stage. Yeah, the Faraday Cup was conceived by our colleagues in the early 90s. The award is to recognize outstanding contributions uh, the, in, to the field of char uh, charged particle beam diagnostics and instrumentation. Julian Bergos, over the years, has gener generously supported this award. Julian passed, as many of you know, pre-COVID in uh, February 2020. This is the first in-person meeting of the IBIC BIW DIPAC in three years. We on the program committee would like to take this time to reflect on the loss of our colleague and dear friend. The IBIC PC vigorously debates submissions for this award with a weighting toward younger scientists and engineers. It is with great pleasure that I can announce the committee has chosen Ihar Lobach for this year's Faraday Cup Award. His work on the statistical properties of undulator radiation. Ihar received his bachelor's degree in physics from Belarusian State University in 2017. He completed his PhD program in particle accelerator physics at the University of Chicago in 2021. His thesis research was carried out at Fermilab's IOTA, Integral, integral uh, optics, Excel, optics Test Accelerator Storage Ring. He studied the statistical properties of the undulator radiation generated by a bunch of electrons and by a single electron circulating in the ring. His thesis advisors were Sergei Negetsev and Julio uh, Stankari. He received the American Physical Society's outstanding, outstanding doctoral thesis research in beam physics award and the Nathan Sugarman Award for Excellence in Graduate Research from Enrico Fermi Institute. Currently, Ihar is an assistant physicist at the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National, at Argonne National Laboratory. His research is focused on applications of machine learning for accelerator tuning, control, and anomaly detection. Okay, and now it's a pleasure for me to, to give the word to you to, to explain your really interesting findings and investigations. Um, uh, yeah, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Kevin. I appreciate it. I'm very humbled and honored to receive this award. Um, I want to thank the selection committee for choosing me for this award and for inviting me to come here. It's really great to be here in Poland. It's also so close to my home country. Uh, also, I want to personally thank Peter and Adriana for helping me get a visa to come here. Uh, it was quite a roller coaster, but eventually it all worked out. And uh, I'm really happy to be here and to be able to meet everybody face to face again. In this presentation, I will uh, talk about two experiments from my dissertation about the statistical properties of undulated radiation, including classical and quantum effects. Researchers from uh, several institutions uh, contributed to this work. Uh, you can see their names in the bottom of this slide. Uh, these experiments uh, took place at Fermilab's Integrable Optics Test Accelerator, IOTA. It's a small 40-meter circumference storage ring, and we worked with electrons at 100 MeV. We used a small permanent magnet undulator that we borrowed from Slack. The fundamental of the undulator radiation was at around one micron. The second harmonic, however, was in the visible range, and you can actually see it in this photo. In this slide, you can see the undulator section in IOTA and the light path from the undulator to the detector. There have been some previous studies into the statistical properties of synchrotron radiation, uh, both theoretical and experimental. 
However, it's fair to say that people are still mostly interested in the average pass-to-pass -pass properties of synchrotron radiation, such as intensity, brightness, uh, spectral angular distribution, and the statistical properties have not been studied to the same level of detail yet. Therefore, the goal of my dissertation was to try to close this gap and also to point out some possible practical applications in beam instrumentation. We carried out two experiments to study the statistical properties of undulator radiation in IOTA. In the first experiment, uh, we kept many electrons in the ring, and we looked at the fundamental harmonic of the undulator radiation with an indium gallium arsenic PIN photodiode. In the second experiment, we kept just a single electron circulating in IOTA, and we looked at the second harmonic of the undulator radiation with a single photon avalanche diode, SPAD detector. In both experiments, we collected turn-by-turn -turn data, and uh, this presentation will be divided into two approximately equal parts, about experiment number one and experiment number two, respectively. So the idea of the first experiment with many electrons was to record the number of uh, detected undulated radiation photons for each revolution in IOTA uh, for about 11,000 consecutive revolutions. Uh, the particle loss during this collection time was negligible. Then we would calculate uh, the variance of the 11,000 recorded numbers. And the initial goal was to systematically study this uh, variance of the number of detected photons as a function of various electron bunch parameters, such as charge, size, uh, shape, divergence, etc. But later, we also realized that we could reverse this procedure and try to infer some electron bunch parameters from the measured variance. The theoretical prediction uh, for the variance of the number of detected photons is the following. Uh, there are two contributions. The first one comes from the uh, discrete quantum nature of light, or simply Poisson fluctuations. Uh, the second contribution comes from the turn-to-turn -turn variations in relative electron positions and directions of motion. The parameter m is conventionally called the number of coherent modes, and it is a function of uh, the electron bunch parameters. To give a better idea about the origin of uh, the second contribution, we can consider a simplified 1D model uh, in which uh, the pulses of electromagnetic field produced uh, by the different electrons will look something like this. And the relative positions between those pulses will be random and different uh, during different passes in the undulator because of synchrotron motion, quantum excitation, etc. And therefore, uh, this overlaps uh, between uh, the different pulses uh, will also change from pass to pass. And the total radiated energy that can be calculated by uh, this integral will have uh, slightly different uh, values uh, during different passes in the undulator. If we consider a Gaussian electron bunch and also a Gaussian radiation, we can arrive uh, at this expression uh, for the number of coherent modes m, uh, which includes uh, the RMS electron bunch duration. In a general case, uh, the number of coherent modes M is a function of detector's angular acceptance, detector's spectral sensitivity, polarization sensitivity, spectral angular properties of the radiation, which can be undulator or benzene magnet or even something else. And it depends on the full 6D phase space density distribution of the electron bunch. Uh, in this PREB paper, we derived an expression for M uh, for this general case for the first time. This expression was derived in assumption of a transversely Gaussian electron beam. Uh, however, uh, the longitudinal electron uh, bunch density distribution can be arbitrary. Uh, it is accounted for uh, by this expression uh, for the effective bunch length. Uh, we also assumed known twist functions in the location of the undulator. The obtained expression is uh, very complex and it includes a multidimensional integral. Uh, however, we provide a computer code for uh, numerical computation uh, therefore, as long as the parameters of the system uh, are available, it's simply a matter of plugging in the numbers into the computer code. Uh, previously, uh, we derived an expression uh, for the second contribution to the fluctuations um, by considering uh, the interference between the classical um, electromagnetic fields produced by the different electrons. In this approach, uh, the first contribution would have to be added uh, by hand uh, because it is purely quantum in nature. However, we were wondering if uh, there is any unified description that could produce both contributions rigorously. And uh, after uh, some consideration, we found such a description uh, within the framework of quantum optics using the density operator formalism. 
and uh, we presented these results in uh, uh, this peer review paper. Now let's move on to the details about the first experiment uh, with many electrons in the ring. In this slide, uh, you can see the spectral composition of our angulated radiation, as well as the angular intensity distribution. Uh, we collected the radiation in a relatively wide spectral range and in a large acceptance angle. The photocurrent pulses from the photodiode uh, went uh, to a simple uh, op-amp integrator, op-amp-based uh, RC integrator, which produced output voltage pulses of comfortably measured amplitude. The number of detected photons at each revolution could be inferred from the amplitude of these voltage pulses. The relative fluctuations of these voltage amplitudes were uh, very small, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 RMS, and we could not measure them directly with our 8-bit oscilloscope because of the finite resolution. Therefore, we had to use the so-called uh, comb filter in which uh, the pulses from the integrator uh, go to a signal splitter. Then in one of the arms, a delay equal exactly to one IOT revolution is introduced, and then the signals are combined again in a hybrid, which produces the difference and the sum of the input signals. In this way, in the difference channel, uh, we can look directly at the difference uh, between two consecutive pulses in IOTA. Therefore, the baseline is removed, and we can uh, use the scale on the oscilloscope effectively in the millivolt range. Of course, our uh, comp filter was not perfect. Uh, there was some crosstalk between the output channels and the small reflected pulse in one of the arms uh, that uh, resulted in a satellite pulse in the uh, difference channel. However, these effects could be easily taken into account and they did not affect the final results. Still, even after using the comp filter, there was uh, some instrumental noise left uh, due to the oscilloscope's preamp and due to the integrator's op-amp. In fact, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio was about one or even slightly small, smaller than one. Uh, because of this, we also had to use a special noise filtering algorithm to extract the actual uh, variance of the number of detected photons from the measured signal. Uh, this algorithm was tested with an independent test uh, light source with known properties, and it proved to be reliable. Finally, in this slide, you can see the results of our measurements of the photoelectron uh, count variance uh, as a function of uh, the beam current in IOTA for the round electron beam as well as uh, our theoretical prediction, the red line, which agrees rather well uh, with the measurement. For this prediction, we had to know the transverse beam emittances uh, and the longitudinal electron bunch uh, density profile. Uh, the transverse beam emittances were inferred uh, from the images uh, of the electron beam uh, produced uh, by the benzene magnet radiation uh, at uh, seven different locations around the ring. Uh, to measure the longitudinal electron bunch density profile, I created uh, this small program uh, that used the signal from the wall current monitor, and it also accounted for the losses and dispersion in uh, the long cable and the transmission function of the amplifier that were located on the way to the oscilloscope. We also decided to carry out uh, some measurements with uh, different neutral density filters using our uh, filter wheel shown in this slide. Uh, a neutral density filter is an optical filter with a constant attenuation in a certain uh, wide spectral range of interest. And uh, our theoretical model uh, predicts uh, that if we carry out measurements with uh, several different neutral density filters at a fixed beam current, uh, the measured number of coherent modes M must be the same. And uh, as you can see um, in this plot, uh, it is actually uh, what we observed in our experiment uh, within the measurement uncertainty. Uh, this further supports our theoretical model. In our previous measurements at variable beam current, uh, the number of coherent modes M changed with the beam current because uh, the parameters of the electron bunch depend on the uh, beam current in IOTA because of intrabeam scattering and interaction of the electron bunch with its environment. And finally, we decided to flip this around uh, and try to reconstruct some electron bunch parameters from the uh, measured variance of the number of detected photons. Uh, this idea resulted in a PRL publication. At the moment, uh, we can only infer one electron bunch uh, parameter at a time uh, using uh, one measured value of the variance of the number of detected photons. 
And we were not interested in measuring the electron bunch length in IOTA because it was relatively large, about 40 centimeters RMS, and it could be easily measured with the wall current monitor. However, we were interested in measuring the transverse uh, beam emittances. Uh, we considered two configurations. In the first configuration, uh, we used uh, the round electron uh, beam uh, whose transverse emittances were made equal by design, and therefore there was only one unknown emittance. And um, the results of our fluctuations-based measurement are shown uh, in this plot as the red points. They agree rather well with the blue line, which is the conventional measurement using the synchrotron light monitors. Uh, then we considered the second configuration in IOTA, uh, the flat uh, electron beam, whose uh, horizontal emittance was still relatively large and it could be uh, reliably measured with the synchrotron light monitors. However, the vertical emittance was uh, so small that it was unresolvable by the synchrotron light monitors. But at the same time, uh, the variance of the number of uh, detected photons uh, was of the same order of magnitude as for the round beam. And therefore, we could use it uh, to reliably estimate the small vertical emittance of the flat beam. Uh, the results of this fluctuation-based uh, measurement are shown as the red points in this plot. This is actually significant because this shows that uh, using our fluctuations-based technique, we could learn something about the flat beam in IOTA that couldn't be measured in any other way at the time. Later, uh, we also made an, an independent estimate uh, for the small vertical emittance of the flat beam using the model uh, for the Tushik uh, beam lifetime. Uh, the results are shown as the black triangles in this plot, and uh, they agree pretty well with the fluctuations-based measurement. There are two requirements for this fluctuations-based technique to work. First, uh, the fluctuations must not be dominated uh, by the Poisson noise, or in other words, the average number of detected photons uh, must be larger than the number of coherent modes M. And second, uh, the number of coherent modes M must be sensitive to changes uh, in uh, transverse uh, beam sizes or emittances. Uh, interestingly, the fulfillment of both of these requirements improves when we consider uh, the electron bunch of smaller size and the radiation of shorter wavelengths. Uh, this means that uh, this technique may be particularly beneficial for the existing state of the art and next generation uh, low emittance, high brightness, ultraviolet, or X-ray synchrotron light sources. For example, we estimated that this technique uh, should be able to measure the small transverse emittances of about 30 picometers in the advanced photon source upgrade at Argon. This technique can be further improved uh, to be able to measure more than one electron bunch parameter at a time uh, by using slits and masks. For example, by using a very narrow uh, vertical slit, it may be possible to force the parameter M to lose its dependence on the horizontal beam size and therefore to measure the vertical beam size directly. Uh, the same, of course, applies to a horizontal slit or one can even consider some unusual masks to study the fluctuations uh, in a certain spectral range. With this, the part about the first experiment with many electrons is over, and now we can move on to the second experiment with a single electron in the ring. It was a natural next step in our research to uh, get rid of the collective contribution to the fluctuations by considering a single electron circulating in IOTA to see if we actually observe the Poissonian photon statistics represented by this relation because there could be some deviations towards uh, super Poissonian light or sub Poissonian light, which would indicate some interesting non-classical state of the radiated field. Most literature sources suggest uh, that we are supposed to see the Poissonian photon statistics with a single electron in the ring. However, there was uh, at least one fairly similar experiment that reported an observation of sub Poissonian statistics in the seventh coherent spontaneous harmonic of AFL radiation. And uh, therefore, we thought that it would still be interesting to carry out this measurement in IOTA. And the second goal was to use the photo count arrival time information to study the synchrotron motion of the single electron. By now, obtaining the single electron in IOTA is a standard and well-established procedure. Uh, the number of detected, the number of electrons in the ring can be inferred uh, from the photo count rate of the synchrotron radiation, and the single electron could be stored in IOTA for up to one or sometimes even two hours at a time. The undulated radiation uh, from a single electron was uh, focused by a single 
uh, focusing lens on the sensitive area of the single photon avalanche uh, diode, SPAD detector. The pulses from the SPAD detector uh, went to a picosecond event timer, uh, which was also provided with the IOT revolution marker. In this way, uh, we were able to create a table containing the revolution number and the detection time relative to the IOT revolution marker for each detection event. For this experiment, I also created a web page with all the controls. Uh, from here, we could move the detector in all three directions uh, to find the optimal location. Uh, there was an optical shutter to protect the detector during normal operation of IOTA. And last but not least, uh, there was a rate meter for the photo counts. In this video, we are simply looking at the dark counts of the SPAD detector. In the optimal location um, of the detector, uh, with a single electron uh, in the ring, uh, the measured photo count rate was about uh, 25 kilohertz, or one detection uh, per about uh, 300 iota revolutions on average. The dark count rate was much lower, only 4 hertz. Since in this experiment we are uh, working with the second harmonic of undulator radiation, uh, the angular intensity distribution is represented by two peaks, and um, you can see uh, that. Um, this photo uh, and our measurement with the SPAD detector look very similar to the simulation. Now we can move on to the analysis of the statistical properties of the collected data. And uh, here uh, we quickly came to one important realization uh, that our SPAD detector is actually binary, which means uh, that it doesn't feel the difference uh, between detections of uh, one, two, three, and so on photons at a time. It always produces the same type of pulse. And uh, because of this, the collected data uh, can be represented as a sequence of zeros and ones only, where every zero represents an iota revolution without a detection event, and every one represents an iota revolution with a detection event. Because of this, we had to adjust our original expectation of uh, Poisson distribution to uh, expectation to observe a sequence of Bernoulli trials, in which case, interestingly, uh, the statistics is slightly sub-Poissonian, uh, but we know the exact reason why. It's because of the principle of operation of our detector. We checked the distribution of inter-arrival times and the distribution of the number of photo counts in a certain time window. And uh, we did not observe any statistically significant deviations uh, from our expectations for a sequence of Bernoulli trials. We also uh, took uh, some measurements with an upgraded setup, which included two SPAD detectors um, separated by a beam splitter. In this case, uh, the photon number resolution was enhanced uh, because now uh, there were three possible outcomes for each revolution in IOTA, uh, zero, one, or two uh, detection events. Uh, still, so far, we have not observed anything unusual. Uh, there uh, was no statistically significant correlation or anti-correlation uh, between the two detectors. The next step will be uh, to carry out the Max Zender interferometry uh, of undulator radiation. Uh, it will uh, improve our understanding of the state of the uh, radiated uh, field. And in some sense, it will allow us to measure uh, the undulator radiation pulse shape in time domain with a sub femtosecond uh, precision. Uh, this experiment is currently under preparation at Fermilab as we speak. And now let's move on to the synchrotron motion of a single electron. As I mentioned before, uh, for each detection event, we also recorded uh, the detection time relative to the iota revolution marker. And we could plot it as a function of the iota revolution number. And then we started to observe this sinusoidal curve. And this actually is the synchrotron motion of a single electron in iota. And we decided to use this as an opportunity to compare the measurement and the simulation of the synchrotron motion. Uh, we used uh, the following turn-by-turn -turn map equations for the relative energy deviation and the RF phase of the electron. Uh, these equations included the radiation damping term, the quantum excitation, and we also included uh, the RF cavity phase jitter as a random Gaussian variable. Uh, to simulate the quantum excitation term, we used uh, the Monte Carlo generator uh, for the energies of benzene magnet radiation uh, photons uh, from this paper. Uh, the first thing we wanted to compare uh, between the measurement and the simulation was the synchrotron motion amplitude as a function of time. Uh, we could fit the collected data with uh, short sinusoids with different amplitudes 
and then we could extract the sequence of amplitudes and plot it as a function of time for the measurement and for the simulation. Uh, as you can see, they both look very similar. They both have this constant fight between uh, quantum excitation and radiation damping. Then we also decided to plot uh, the histogram for the synchrotron motion amplitudes uh, for uh, the measurement and for the simulation at uh, several different values of the RMS RF cavity phase jitter. In this way, we were able to infer the most likely value of the RMS RF cavity phase jitter in IOTA. Uh, these results were recently published in the Journal of Instrumentation. Further, uh, by using uh, the same uh, piecewise sinusoidal feed, uh, we were able to uh, plot the dependence of the uh, synchrotron motion uh, period uh, on the synchrotron uh, motion amplitude for the measurement and for the simulation. Uh, again, the agreement is uh, pretty good, which means that our understanding of the uh, parameters of the IOTA ring uh, is rather good as well. Interestingly, uh, the synchrotron motion period is not a constant as a function of the synchrotron motion amplitude, uh, but this should be expected because it is well known that uh, the synchrotron motion oscillations are not exactly harmonic. And uh, lastly, I would like uh, to discuss the effect of the detector's timing resolution. Uh, we decided to plot a histogram uh, for uh, the residuals uh, between the uh, collected uh, data points and the sinusoidal feed. And then we arrived uh, at this uh, nice distribution, which describes the random time delays introduced by the detection system, uh, mostly by the SPAD detector. Uh, interestingly, this distribution is asymmetric, uh, but this should actually be expected because by definition, the random time delays uh, cannot be negative. When these residuals are removed, uh, we can obtain this nice real-time video, uh, which represents the evolution in time of the probability function uh, to find uh, the electron at a certain longitudinal position. And uh, this is all I have here. I just want to uh, acknowledge the uh, guidance and support from my thesis advisors, Sergei Nagaitsev and Julius Tankari, who also nominated me for this award. And I'm very thankful to the entire FAST slash IOTA team for their contributions to these experiments. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk, showing us the flight or the, 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 uh, the modern, modern physics uh, for, for, for single particles uh, behavior. Maybe there are some. Comments and questions? <coughs> yes, thank you, Iha, for a very comprehensive talk. Uh, can you explain a little how the number of undulator periods enters into the analysis and do coherent modes become important at some point? Um, yeah, so the, the number of undulator uh, periods uh, the, the number of coherent modes M depends on the number of undulator uh, periods, and uh, uh, the one over M increases uh, if we increase the number of undulator radiation periods, and uh, usually this improves uh, the ability to um, observe uh, the second contribution to the fluctuations, which is useful for the practical applications when we want to measure the electron beam parameters uh, using this method. And um, what was the second part of the question? Well, if you increase the number of periods, do you eventually get coherent modes? Well, so as I said, it changes the number of coherent modes M. Yeah. Uh, by coherent modes, okay, so I, I guess you mean like uh, when uh, uh, we, we start to see some like stimulated emission, uh, like slowly go into the AFL regime. Um, that that can happen, yeah, that's not something that we observed here. I estimated the gain lengths for our undulator. We were far from it, from, far from reaching uh, uh, any like, AVL effects. Okay, thank you. There's another question, yeah, over there. Uh, uh, hello, uh, uh, thank you for this um, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I was uh, wondering about uh, I have a theoretical question. Um, the uh, the model for uh, the calculation is uh, is it based on the Volkov states? 
Volk states. Uh, Fol Volkov states. So these uh, coherent states, are you producing oh. them uh, out of the model from uh, Volkov? Oh, is this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, is it, it is based on the uh, uh, coherent states, yes, and mm -hmm. uh, what about them? Yeah, and uh, so uh, how does the, uh, the vector potential enters the, the theory of the, um, of the emission? So uh, how do you, so can you uh, um, please elaborate a little bit of the, of the model, maybe this is the question. Yeah, so um, the, the model is based on uh, uh, the radiation produced by a, a classical current. By, by that I mean that uh, the electron uh, recoil is assumed to be negligible. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, uh, there is a pretty similar description, simple description where there is a classical, uh, the, the, the electron's current is uh, considered as classical, uh, only the radiation is quantum. Okay. And uh, yeah. there is a, uh, uh, like long time ago, like in the 60s, uh, Glauber showed that in this case, uh, the radiated field is always in a coherent state. Yeah. And uh, the rest of the description is based on this, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, there's no further uh, question. Yeah, let's thank the prize award winner. <laughs> the prize, very good work. <clears throat> <clears throat>